You are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. So here we are. Episode 200 is upon us. And a milestone that seemed like an impossibility when I started Mysteries and Monsters back in March 2019. Thank you to the listeners, both old and new. To my fabulous Patreon supporters and the listeners who take the time to drop me an email or a message on social media. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, before I start dropping into Oscar speech territory, I'm delighted to welcome, on this 200th episode, one of my most popular guests for his second appearance on the show, and that is, of course, the one and only Stan Gordon. With over seven decades of investigation, Stan is one of the most diligent and knowledgeable researchers out there, and we return to Chestnut Ridge and beyond on the hunt for Bigfoot, UFOs, Thunderbirds, and some very creepy cryptids. Before that, though, as always, you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. Four dollars a month gets you ad-free episodes, early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click in the link in the show notes, as usual. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, episodes, and merchandise. Thank you as always for his continued support through all 200 episodes and his marvellous artwork. To Dean Bestall, the show is produced by the wonderful Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. The Keystone State now awaits us in the company of Stan Gordon. On today's episode, I am delighted to welcome back author, researcher and investigator Stan Gordon. Stan has been searching out strange events since the early 60s, and his books are a must-have for anyone with an interest in high strangeness and fortiana. His latest book, Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania, is the fourth such case book, and I am delighted to welcome Stan back to Mysteries and Monsters. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Paul. It's great, uh, great to be back on your program. It's an absolute pleasure. It's one of those things that I sometimes look at my previous guests and I think, oh, I'd love to speak to those people again. And then sometimes you suddenly realize that two years has passed. Yes, time goes uh, very quickly sometimes, that's for sure. (laughs) As we were touching on in the introduction, you have continued to chase down and investigate all these manner of strange things that have been going on. And obviously for a lot of people, your work is primarily in the modern era known from your wonderful Silent Invasion book, which is still one of my very favourite strange encounters and, and occurrences collections that I've ever come across, Stan. Are you surprised that your particular area of the United States is often overlooked, do you think, in regards to some of these other more notable windows of high strangeness? Well, actually, again, you know, there's been a, a lot of reference to what we're doing here in the investigations going on. I'm in touch with a lot of other researchers here in Pennsylvania who are very actively out there investigating some of these cases even more recently. Uh, you know, I've been out in the field since 1965, since the Kecksburg incident happened. And now it's going on 63 years, and I still haven't seen a UFO or a Bigfoot, but I've, I've seen a lot of evidence. I've interviewed thousands of UFO witnesses and hundreds of Bigfoot and cryptid witnesses over the years. Uh, my hot dive has been open since 1969. It never stops ringing between email reports and phone reports. And I can tell you the, the last, last couple of years have been very busy, but all through last year and then continuing, interestingly, through the fall and winter months of this year and right up through the last few days, it's just been nonstop UFO activity, uh, a lot of daylight reports coming in, uh, some very low-level close-range UFO encounters in the last couple of years and recent months. Uh, and then we're having, we've had daylight Thunderbird sightings. Bigfoot sightings, Black Panther sightings, just a lot of strange things going on. And really what's really interesting are 
these ongoing reports which seem to be increasing since at least March of this year and going on right through the last week. Uh, I called them mini UFOs for years when I started hearing about them back in the 1960s. Uh, a lot of people are beginning to hear more about this now, but these are these small, generally spherical, but not always generally spherical objects that are not high in the sky, but they're very low to the ground. They range anywhere from a few inches, so they're about, oh, like, look, like oversized fireflies or lightning bugs, depending on where you're out in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, they range up to about a foot or two in diameter, but a lot of them are about the size of like a golf ball or a baseball. They're generally, again, spherical. They are sometimes solid metallic looking, but most of the time they're just bright spheres of luminous colors of various colors. What's so intriguing about them is they're coming very, I mean, within feet of people. They're coming right up to people in some cases. I've had incidents over the years where they've followed vehicles, uh, where they've entered people's homes and cars through open windows and then went, went right out to the body of the vehicle or right through or back out the window. These cases are just really, really interesting. And here's what started happening a number of years ago. I started writing about and talking about it, and now it's going all, all over the country. I mean, if you go search the Internet, you'll see many, many stories about this now around the country, and I believe also in your country as well, that in areas we have a lot of history of Bigfoot activity, witnesses and investigators are also reporting and kind of these small spheres of light that are coming low down in the trees and then coming low off the ground and approaching some of these people pretty close. And um, that's going on all over the country now. You know, it, it's really intriguing. I started noticing these incidents back in about 1972, early 70s. I started writing about it in the 1970s. And now, years and years later, now you're beginning to hear so much more about these same type of things. And uh, it's really interesting what's happening. Do you think that this is because people seem to be more open to coming forwards in regards to strange encounters? Because the United States is probably very famous for a couple of notable areas in, in the country where there are mysterious light scene. I'm thinking probably the, the Marfa lights and the Brown Mountains are, are probably the two most famous ones and the Min Min lights in Australia stand. So do you think, whilst these are not the same thing in, the, in, in, in a direct comparison to what you're reporting on, do you think people are more open about coming forwards when they're seeing these strange lights? Because it does seem that over the last sort of five or ten years, people are becoming more honest in regards to encountering moments of high strangeness. Well, of course, you know, in this country, there, there's a lot of media coverage now. We have many television shows talking about these various uh, anomalies that are going on. Uh, it's all over the Internet now. But, you know, and again, now the United States government is formally back into UFO investigations and they're opening the door a little more and they're at least uh, indicating that there's something out there they can identify. And uh, that's, a, that's a good step in the right direction. But I, I think... That the phenomena, what I've been finding is so strange. It is so unusual. I think we're dealing with something, as we talk, I'm sure when we talk about some of the cases, that we're dealing with something that's far beyond our present scientific understanding. I don't think anybody understands what's going on. It's so bizarre. Of, of the thousands of the cases I worked on over the years, you know, back when I started this so many years ago, back at least in the early uh, 60s and the 70s, the, the general thought among many researchers was that a lot of these UFO observations are likely some type of spacecraft from another planet, extraterrestrial nature. The more I know about what we're dealing with, I think that maybe a small number of these things might be extraterrestrial. But more and more, the, the cases I'm looking into and others I'm familiar with, that we're dealing with something, and this is not just the UFO aspect of it, but uh, some of the cryptic things that I'm beginning to find some similarities with, especially the Bigfoot phenomena, where I uncover a lot of very strange elements to it that suggest a Bigfoot is much stranger than just an unknown animal. And there's a physical and a non-physical component to it. And for lack of a better term, I'll call it interdimensional right now. It is remarkable. I think these ideas, for a lot of us, Stan, have been around for quite a while. But I've been quite surprised that it's taken so long for people to kind of begin to look into this interdimensional aspect. Because for me, obviously, my first sort of experience and involvement in reading about these things was looking at the work of, of John Keel and, and Jacques Vallée when they were kind of pushing forward this idea of some kind of universal trickster that was pulling our leg from beyond the veil. So are you intrigued or surprised that it's taken this long for this alternative theory to kind of gain as much traction as it has over recent years? Well, you know, I, I was in touch back in the 70s, and, and we'll talk about that massive wave where many 
strange things began to come to my attention with Bigfoot. Because mm -hmm. when I got involved, I was investigating Bigfoot sightings here in Pennsylvania back in the 1960s. And there had been a long history of that prior to that uh, period of time. And I had always felt when I was out in the field at that time that we're dealing with some type of unknown animal, some type of unknown primate. Well, then all these events begin to happen in 1972, then mainly that major wave in 1973. And, um, you know, I was lucky. I had my, my first volunteer research group established in 1970. And uh, that group was kind of unique in that it was uh, mainly made up of specialists. We had scientists, uh, engineers, technicians, police officers, former military people, all kind of specialists. We all volunteered our time to investigate these reports around our regular jobs. I had to set up that we could respond to cases 24 hours a day when, when we were able to. We did in many cases. And by 1973, we had extended to cover the entire state of Pennsylvania. And we were getting many, many reports in it. And we were surprised that we were beginning to get our referrals in from the law enforcement agencies, from the news media. And we were just being jammed with reports. And we were lucky that we were set up because here comes 1973, first with the biggest UFO outbreak ever documented. I mean, it went on all year long from January 1st and the end of the year. And there were hundreds and hundreds of UFO cases coming in. And back in those days, our, our local newspapers, some of the statewide newspapers, even some of the national media was picking up some of these cases that were going on across the state. It was amazing. I mean, a lot of these were not just high altitude lights in the sky. A lot of these were large structured objects low to the ground. So, so we had incidents where they were hovering over highways, following vehicles, there were landing reports. I mean, it was just amazing in itself. And then in the summer of 73, we have the biggest outbreak of Bigfoot sightings. And that went on to early 1974. And there were many Bigfoot sightings. And some of these cases, witnesses were, were with the feet of these creatures. In some cases, there was more than one creature seen together. But interestingly, here's what goes on. As we're investigating these cases, my teams are out there day and night. We're on the scene sometimes within minutes to hours after they occur. And one of the first things that made, our, made us wonder what was happening is you get out to some of these locations. So it's under all different type of ground conditions, including in the wintertime when there's fresh snow. And you have these series of odd looking footprints that go for a distance and then just abruptly stop when there should have been more tracks. There was no way you could have fabricated under the conditions we found. And that was just very, very startling. And then things began to get even stranger. So again, you got to remember, communications back in the 1973 was not like it is today. And he had no cell phones back in those days. So people didn't know generally what most people were seeing or hearing, especially in widespread areas. And we would get these reports from different people who were very reluctant to tell us about seeing these tall, hair-covered creatures, even in daylight, that they're watching these things, for example, across the field. And suddenly this thing physically vanishes and disappears and reappears at another location seconds later. Well, like, what is this all about? And then we began to see this pattern. We'd have a UFO sighting in a certain area. Within minutes to hours to days later, we'd have a Bigfoot encounter or vice versa. So I'm sure what we're going to get into now, we'll probably get in some of these cases that you probably want to talk about. And I am not suggesting that Bigfoot is a passenger or a pilot of a spaceship from another planet. Because we don't know for sure what the UFO phenomena really is or what it originates from. We can speculate. All I can tell you, there was there is some correlation between some of the cases, some of the UFO incidents and Bigfoot encounters, and even these strange spheres of light with Bigfoot. And one of the cases that showed up in 1973 in September during all this wave that really made us wonder was we had an incident north of Pittsburgh. There were two witnesses out in the country waiting for uh, a ride for somebody to take them somewhere. They see this tall, around seven foot tall, hairy Bigfoot with dirty white matted hair running across the road towards the woods, but in one of its hands, it's carrying a small, luminous ball of light. And a short time later, an object came across the sky and projected a beam of light down into the woods where the creature ran into. So that was just the beginning of when we were beginning to realize we're dealing with something very strange. That whole flap in the, in the early 70s, Stan, is, is remarkable because I think it's really interesting when you read Silent Invasion, as you say, at that point, you'd clearly got a sort of idea of what you thought Bigfoot was and what was going on in regards to other kinds of strange phenomena that people were reporting in this area. How long into it was it that you began to scratch your head and think, well, everything I thought I knew 
just doesn't fit these this pattern here. People are reporting things that just don't seem to be what's been recorded previously. Well, you know, it was a matter of uh, weeks and weeks and all these reports are coming in. And then as the months went on and the reports got much more detailed and more, much more unusual. And of course, then we had that, that classic case of October 25th, 1973 up in Fayette County, PA, which is an area that continues to be extremely active, including the last couple of weeks. Uh, at that area, so some of the areas, especially along the Chef's Nook Ridge, and I'm sure we'll bring this up because we'll be talking about it more, and you're going to hear more and more about the Chef's Nook Ridge because there's so many anomalies going on and have been for years and years, but now it's really getting very interesting up in some of those areas. But the Chef's Nook Ridge is a mountain range that extends through Westmoreland, Fayette, and Indiana County in southwest Pennsylvania. It extends down outside of Morgantown, West Virginia for a few miles. So it, it's a little less than 100 miles long, somewhere around there. And for years and years, I started hearing about it back in the late 60s. I've been investigating incidents up there ever since, and it is one of those hotbed areas, especially in Westmoreland, Fayette County, where Year after year, we have cryptid encounters, Bigfoot encounters, UFO encounters, all kind of phenomena is being reported by the public up there, and it's very, very intriguing. But as, again, the, the one case, October 25th, 73, that was the case that my team, and, and I had a lot of skeptical research people in my group. I mean, some of these guys were hardcore scientists that had high positions in some of the big industries here in the Pittsburgh area. They were doing their research with me anonymously because of their positions. But as these cases began to come in and they're out there in the field and they're on the scene soon after, they interview the witnesses. Sometimes we had physical evidence. They begin to see the patterns forming. They began to realize there's something going on here. We just don't understand what it is. But that case was amazing. I got a call from a state police officer from needing the town barracks in Fayette County that evening. It was about 1030. And uh, I'm, I'm giving you the short part of the story. You've read it yourself. A silent invasion is a very, very long, detailed case. So I'm just going to summarize the, the most important part of it. And uh, he just came back from this incident. There were multiple witnesses, like 15 people that evening that observed this barn size of this very large round red sphere about 100 feet off the ground hovering and moving slowly down towards the pasture on the farm. And um, the farmer's son, who would be the eldest of this trio of witnesses we're going to talk about, he sees it. He sees people outside watching this thing. He goes to a, a better location to get a better look at this thing. It looks like it is going to land on his dad's property. There were two young boys up at that house. All three of them decide they want to go up in that pasture and see what this thing is. So they go over to his dad's farm and they grab a high-powered weapon, a 30 odd 6 with a handful of ammunition. And he didn't realize at the time he had two tracer bullets. So when, you, when that tracer bullet is fired, you just get that luminous trail. So the hunters out there will recognize that. Anyhow, they're, uh, they start proceeding down the farm lane. Dogs around the area are carrying on tremendously. They had this high-pitched whining noise and these loud baby crying noises. And those sounds are getting louder and louder as they get closer to the pasture area. They angle their truck, leave the headlights on so they can see their path up the hill. But they also notice that something looks like something's straining the power from the headlights. So they've never had that kind of problem before. They make their way up to the hill to the pasture and they're looking across the field and they can't believe what they're seeing. Here's this huge, solid, luminous, dome-shaped object on the ground or right above it. So now this big, round object is now like a big, white dome, like a half of a sphere. It's about 100 feet or so in diameter. It's very large, making that high-pitched whining noise. And they're just standing there watching this thing. They can't figure out what this thing might be. And as they're studying it, their eyes are drawn to a barbed wire fence about 75 feet away. Along that fence, you have these two huge, hair-covered, Bigfoot-type creatures one behind the other, walking slowly in their direction. The one in front's about eight feet tall. The one behind it's about seven feet tall. They're covered with long, dark hair, matted hair hanging off the body. They have uh, luminous, large, luminous, glowing green eyes. They have no neck. The arms, which are interesting, this isn't walking upright on two legs. And the arms are so long, they're hanging below the knees, but they almost reach to the ground. They're so long. And the one young boy is so frightened, he runs out of the field. And the other young fellow yells to the older fellow that shoot at them, shoot at them. So he takes the first shot, which is a tracer. He fires over their head. He fires the tracer. There's no response. But when he fires that second shot, which is the second tracer, the largest of the two creatures reaches out as though they grab at that tracer, makes a loud whining, crying noise. And at that moment, that huge luminous object vanishes and disappears. 
It doesn't accelerate, believe the area. It's just gone. So most of the luminosity is gone. The sound stops. The creatures turn around, start slowly walking back along the fence line towards the woods. The fellow now has his weapon loaded. He's fired live ammo from his 30 6 into them. There's no effect on them whatsoever. They don't hurry up. They don't speed up. There's just no effect on them whatsoever. They run back to their vehicle, take the uh, bed in their farmhouse. They take the people out there to a neighbor's and they call the police. When the state trooper arrived about 45 minutes later, they went up into the field that we interviewed the trooper. And he said when they got to the scene, they were looking for evidence where this happened. And he said the area where the object was on the ground was self-luminescent glowing, about 100 feet or more in diameter. He said he noticed that the farm animals would not go anywhere near it, that he shined his flashlight beam into it. He could barely see it. And he said he was certain if he had a newspaper, he could have read the newspaper from the light coming off the glow. That's the short part of the story. As you thread in the book, it gets much deeper, much more unusual. That was the case that convinced us that there's something very strange going on here with Bigfoot, and it's much more bald than we ever realized. And then the case had got even stranger in the weeks ahead. Yeah, I think that's the, as you say, that's a real introduction to it, because that in itself is a really odd situation that went on and would kind of contradict anything that you thought you knew and many of us would believe would be the normal response when you come across a Bigfoot-type creature, Stan. And yet, this particular witness ends up having all kinds of strange phenomena follow on from it, as you refer to there, which even includes mysterious visitors, strange dreams. And this was something he referred to when you, you went back and interviewed him in later years as well. He was still very adamant that this was just a really strange set of incidents that he just couldn't explain. And, and he was a person who was a complete non-believer. He used to laugh at people and talk about seeing things like that. His life was changed afterwards, and there was a lot of strange things. But yeah, it was very interesting. And and as you read, uh, when you read the Silent Invasion book, that um, there was some mystery men showing up during the time of 73 war investigations. But on a follow-up investigation years later, when we went up just to interview him again to keep track of him and just to find out if anything else interesting had happened, if he had heard anything, we had never hypnotized him at the time. And uh, as you know, a famous psychiatrist at the time who was involved in some of these was Dr. Berthold Schwartz. He spent a week up here interviewing everybody. He went away convinced these people are all telling the truth. But he recommended at the time, because of some of the circumstances, not to hypnotize him. So we did not. We had some trained people in our group that could have, but we did not utilize that. We rarely ever used hypnosis in the cases we had. But anyhow, so going back to years later on the follow-up, we approached the witness and said, we're, we're thinking about the possibility of using hypnosis. And he looked at us very strangely and he said, well, why do you want to do it again? And I looked at my research associate and well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, he said, back at the time was happening, you had your teams up here a lot and people were coming up to interview me all the time. And he said, these two men showed up and he, he said, I always thought they were somehow connected to your group. But he said, one was in a dark suit, the other was in a an Air Force uniform, and that man had a briefcase, and they wanted him to describe all the events that happened that day, that evening, with the Bigfoot and the UFO, to describe in detail what the object looked like, what the creatures looked like, and what they did. And then, surprisingly, that Air Force man pulled out of his briefcase a set of photographs of what I was told were pictures of UFOs and Bigfoot. And I remember him telling me there was one picture of a Bigfoot carrying a dead pig under its arm, climbing a fence, I believe, in the state of Georgia. But they wanted him to pick out the pictures that looked similar to what he saw. And then they apparently did hypnotize him, and they told him that they appreciate all his time, that they believed the story, that they would be in touch, but he never heard from them again. And, of course, we tried to track whoever they were down. We never quit. And of course, Project Blue Book had officially shut down in January of 1970. This was 1973. So whoever these fellows were, we still have no idea. <laughs> I think what I found really interesting about the whole situation that was going on at that time, Stan, was the fact that you would often suspect that things might begin to slow down. But obviously this particular encounter and the event itself was towards the end of 1973 as well, which for a lot of people, you would suspect that, especially that time of year, as you've referred to when I've heard you discuss these sightings over recent years, that often as we approach winter, things begin to tail off. And yet this is probably one of the most strange encounters in the whole situation that was going on at that time. Oh, yeah. And then that case in February of 74. Well, that was the case. And there were other cases, too. But that was the case 
that convinced me. And I, I'm pretty certain some of the people with, I was involved with investigating that we're dealing with something that is not a normal flesh and blood animal. That has a physical and a non-physical aspect to it. And that was the case that occurred um, up toward the area of what is known as Ohio Pile, way up in the mountains of Fayette County as well. And of course, of course, I'll be glad to tell you about it if you like. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think some people have yet to enjoy your wonderful silent invasion book, Stan. So for anybody who's not aware of that strange case, I think, yes, please. Okay, so February 6, 1974. And uh, I'm sure you have a lot of listeners here in the United States as well. So some of these people might remember the time period. There was a big national trucker strike. There was gas rationing going on across the country. So I couldn't get up to the scene to the next morning because I couldn't get gas locally. And um, there was a lot of violence apparently going on around the country. And in Pennsylvania, our National Guard members were also patrolling with the state police, patrolling the roads and highways. They responded to this incident. I couldn't get up there again till next morning. But anyhow, here's the story. That evening, this woman who lived very deep in the mountains, uh, lived there all her life, knew animals quite well, was a good shot, pretty much not afraid of anything. She was watching TV as normal. On her little cabin front porch, she had a number of empty soda cans, pop cans laying out there, and there, those little metal cans, and uh, something was knocking the pop cans around. So there had been some wild dogs came through uh, two or three weeks before, and she figured, I bet those dogs are back. So she thought in her head, she said, I'll grab my shotgun, which is a, which is a 16-gauge double barrel shotgun, and I'll load one chamber and I'll fire over the head of those dogs and scare those dogs away. So she proceeds to grab her shotgun. She loads one chamber. She walks up to the front door. She turns on the switch on the wall. The light comes on on the front porch, and she steps out. And there's no dogs there. But about six feet in front of her, it says at least seven foot tall, hair covered creature, very typical of a, of a Bigfoot. And what it did was, as she put the light on, it raised its arms straight up over its head. And what's her reaction? She fires right into it. There's this brilliant flash of light, like the flash on a camera, she said, like a strobe on a camera. And the creature physically vanished from sight. It was gone. But then again, what's interesting is her in laws lived about 100 feet away. They heard the gunshot. They called her to say, what are you shooting at? She tried to tell him. So her, her son-in-law, he grabbed his sidearm, his pistol. He starts walking down that dark road. He sees a, a dark figure running down a road ahead of him. Couldn't tell who it was. And then as he got closer, at some point, he said he was surrounded by four or five hairy people with eyes like coals of fire. And about the same time, there's this large luminous object that was described looking like a big Christmas ornament hovering over the woods at the same time. They were, they got pretty nervous, and that's when they called the state police. And I talked to the primary investigator, and he said by the time they found the place and got up there, whatever was there was gone. He said the witnesses were very, very shook up. They were very credible people, and he said something very strange happened up there. And that he, that he said he based on the animal reaction, because they had a number of animals on the farm. In particular, they had several big dogs. I think there were five of them. I think one was an Eskimo spit, I think one was a German Shepherd. When they arrived on the scene, everything was quiet. The dogs wouldn't bark, they wouldn't make a sound. And I remember him telling me one of those dogs was in a cage, and it wasn't moving or responding, and he opened the cage up. <laughs> and that dog should have ripped his arm off, and the dog wouldn't even move. And there were other animals on the farm that were actually very unusual from the normal behavior as well. When I got up to the scene the next morning, all the dogs were barking, everything was back to normal. But I can tell you, one of the very common animal reactions with Bigfoot is, is that even the most ferocious dogs and big dogs, when they're in close proximity to these creatures, they're just like paralyzed. They do not bark. They shake. They tower. Sometimes they'll lay there and their eyes will move around. They won't bark or respond. Uh, it's just amazing. And that's something that's been very, very common. So that was the case among other incidents. And there have been cases more and more going on over the years. And again, this is going, it's not just here in Pennsylvania. I mean, I was in touch with other researchers back in the 70s, what, some of the well-known names of that time from around the country and around the world, telling about what I was finding. And some of these others were telling me, they said, we're having the same thing going on. But they said, we're, we're not going to write about it because everybody will think we're crazy. We don't want to be laughed at by our peers. Well, that was okay if that's what they wanted to do. My position was, this is what we're finding. This is what we're documenting. We don't know what's going on, but I'm putting it out there. So hopefully we'll get some more input and people will take this a little more seriously. And that's when it all began. I find that quite strange looking back that, as you refer to there, there's clearly 
a lot of this been going on in different areas. And as you mentioned there, Stan, people were obviously coming across this, these occurrences and these cases. And like you say, they were deciding not to write about them or recall them because it was too outside of their comfort zone or, or it just didn't fit into what they were researching. So it, it seems quite frustrating when we look back that this body of evidence could have been even bigger than, the, than what we have in certain areas because some people just didn't want to talk about it, as you mentioned. Right. And, and you still have to deal with that today. It's not nearly what it used to be. I can tell you over the last few years, there have been several very good books written here in the United States talking about the same thing that's going on now. I know that around the country here in the United States, again, in areas where there's a history of Bigfoot sightings, they're seeing more and more of those small little uh, spheres of light below the ground. It's, it's just very, very intriguing. But yeah, it's been going on for years and years. And I know there are incidents in England as well that I've heard about. Yeah, we've got a couple of areas of high strangeness, especially on the, the east coast of England with a, a, a friend of mine, Paul Sinclair, who's done a lot of work out there and with strange lights and strange encounters and shadowy figures and missing time. It seems to be one of those areas that nothing's off the table, Stan. Everything seems to be going off. And obviously, as you've continued to document in your casebook series, there just seems to be everything going on there. It is. And again, uh, what I found is that a person can be in the right place at the right time and just happen to see a UFO or a Bigfoot walk out in front of his car on the road. However, there are certain, and Chestnut Ridge, again, is a very long area, so I can't say any specific area. I'm just saying there are certain areas along the ridge that are very active. So that's a long area, but there are more specific locations, geographical locations. And I've been looking at this now for years, and, uh, and again, I started seeing this back in the 70s. And then it happened more again in, in right 1979 and the early 80s. We had another significant area on the Westmore Armstrong County border that went on for years. Even though I still hear some activity around there, it was amazing what was going on for years. It was such a big outbreak and so strange that actually one of the TV stations in Pittsburgh came out and did a, a, a serious story on it. And it was a major news story as well. From when I remember... 1979, the summer of that year, an object fell from the sky into a wooded area. As soon after, the locals out in that rural air began to hear screams and cries. They would begin to have see the small orbs of light. All, uh, they were finding strange footprints. And then 81 and 82, things really got really busy out there with Bigfoot encounters, Black Panther encounters, all kinds of things going on. But now, over the years, there's other more specific locations here in Pennsylvania including one that's more recent, is very, very active as of last week. There's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of things being documented there now. It's very intriguing. They're calling it Area X. It's also in a section of Fayette County, but there are other areas out there in other parts of the state. And now in the last few years, I'm hearing other people from all over the country where you have these locations, you have these more specific geographical properties where this phenomenon is going on. And a lot of these have a long history of these things going on too, but you're now beginning to hear more and more about something and why it's going on, we just don't know. I think what I love about the most recent case book, Stan, is the variety of weird things that are included in it. Because as we've touched on here, we've been talking about UFO sightings and Bigfoot and disappearing creatures and strange balls of light. And yet in your case book, one of the first stories that really sticks out to me is this witness that reported encountering some kind of giant rabbit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, and again, I, I talked to a person, I've heard other similar stories over the years, very rarely, but I've heard other people say that, but I, I interviewed this fellow several times. I mean, a very, very credible witness. And those are the things that showed up. And then if you go further in the book, you know, I, I deal with all kinds of strange cases all the time, but then there's a the case in the book that actually gave me the chills a little. And that's that encounter with that gigantic spider on the side of a house, which <laughs> interestingly just kind of folded up and vanished and disappeared before it fell to the ground. <laughs> and again, we're finding so many similarities with some of the, the really strange aspects of Bigfoot and some of these other cryptid cases that uh, I think more and more that the lot of these cases somehow are all interconnected. It's all energy connected from what I can see. One of the patterns I found many years ago is that many close range, low level UFO sightings and many encounters with Bigfoot and other cryptids often occur in the vicinity of high energy sources. So once again, you've got many encounters around bodies of water, railroad tracks, 
high tension power lines, power plants, uh, let me see, radio communication towers, gas lines, gas wells, windmill farms, goes on and on and on. Many, many reports, especially in the areas where there's a lot of repeat activity, you have a lot of these energy sources. One of the other trends that I've always been interested in when I've heard you speak and reading your work, Stan, is this generational aspect. The more cases that you uncover in a variety of weird encounters, as we were saying there about this person who claims to have seen a giant rabbit and, and some of the other Black Panther witnesses and, and UFO witnesses, I know you've mentioned that often people may have some kind of generational tie to this, that if their grandparents or their parents have had some kind of encounter, doesn't have to be a UFO sighting. It could be a, a haunting or a Bigfoot encounter. It seems as though certain people have better luck encountering, well, it's a matter of opinion, better luck, Stan, I suppose how frightening the experience is, that they, uh, <laughs> that they end up having an experience themselves, despite the fact it might be something slightly different. Yeah, and that's something, again, I've been looking into this for years. I'm in touch with many people, even recent weeks and months. Uh, some of these people I've been in contact with for over 40 years. And, uh, and then a lot of people I've just got in touch with in the last year. And they have no idea about these other people or their accounts. And I, and I made the statement a couple of times that if I could take 10 of these people who don't know each other, put them in a separate room, have them write down some of the experiences they've had throughout their life, if you would read them and see the similarities, you would just be amazed. It's so, it's so amazing. And uh, again, uh, some most of these cases, from what I can tell, the people I interviewed, there's one person in particular. I've been in touch with her for way over 40 years. She she was missing at the back in the 60s, I believe it was. She was a very young child that was missing. There was apparently a, a big search for her, and they searched for hours, and they couldn't find her, and they found her in the middle of a field, and she said she'd been there the whole time. and she had had all kind of paranormal experience from the time she was a young girl in her home. Uh, later in life, she and then I, her husband and others around her had, time, had Bigfoot encounters. They had other cryptid encounters. Later on in her life, her children began to have experiences, and now her grandchildren are. And I found this in other families as well. Some of it goes back to the witness I'm talking to goes back to at least their grandparents or their other relatives who have had these things too. So it, it's a much more involved, but could it be that certain people have certain abilities that they're able to perceive these various anomalies other people can't? Or is it maybe that the phenomena is attracted to them for whatever reason? We just don't know. And again, it, I said years and years ago, the phenomena is so strange, it protects itself because it is so hard to believe, unless you're involved in this or you're a witness and, and you've had some of your experiences. I mean, I interviewed a fella last week at, just approached me about something I've been three years ago, which is just an incredible account. I'm still doing more research on it now. And I mean, it, it, it fits in with all these other cases and it's so strange and bizarre. And he's, I mean, when I talk to him in person, you can just see the hair standing on, on his arms. And I mean, that's the kind of reaction I'm getting from so many of the witnesses I interview are people who never believed that these things could ever occur to they had their own personal experiences. And it's a life-changing event for so many of these people. And each case, there's similarities, but there's some differences at times as well. Do you find the people that aren't believers, Stan, or have no real interest in this subject, whatever field of it it, it is, usually make the better witness? Because obviously, whatever they've experienced has completely shaken their understanding of the world around them, and therefore... They have nowhere to turn. As far as they're concerned, life just cannot be the same because everything they thought they knew has been completely turned on its head because of what they've experienced. Oh, it's very cool. In fact, that, that man I just interviewed, uh, I told you recently, they had this very strange multiple account incident with another witness. He, he said to me, he said, my life is completely different now. He said, he said, I still have trouble dealing with what happened. And uh, that's very common. And so, yes, so many of the people call me. And again, these are people from all backgrounds, men, women, and children. Many of these people are professionals. They're, they're school teachers or engineers or police officers or first responders or all kind of professionals who want no publicity. All they want to know is, did anybody else ever see you like this? Do you know about any other similar reports? Because they can't, they're having trouble dealing with it. Most of them would never have believed it until they had their own encounter. And I can tell you, prior to the pandemic, 
I was interviewing a, a number of outdoorsmen, hunters, fellows who've been out the woods for years and years. They used to laugh at people talking about seeing Bigfoot, these other strange things in the woods. And I had, I remember talking to these guys, and they had tears coming out of their eyes as I'm looking at them right in their face, describe what happened, telling me that one guy was telling me, he said, I spent the whole life, my whole life in the woods. He said, I'm not even going back in the woods anymore. And I mean, that's a, a common reaction in some of the cases. I always find hunters who have those kinds of experiences stand some of the most compelling people you can hear from because a lot of them have this emotional response that they've spent decades hunting, trapping, tracking animals. They know everything that's out there. And yet when they have an experience like this and, and skeptics all say, oh, well, it's misidentification. And you think, well, if these people have been out there for 30, 40 years, Stan, I'm hard pressed to believe that anybody could have such an emotional reaction to a misidentification of an alleged bear, for example. Right. And, and and again, as you read in my books, so many of these cases, they're not like you see on some of the TV shows in the dark. You know, half a mile away, seeing a shadow. I mean, some of the cases I have, and they're very well documented. I mean, these people are 5, 10, 20 feet away from these things. And saw these things from head to toe. And some have had direct eye contact with them. I mean, it's just amazing things. And, yeah, that's the kind of thing that's, that's been happening. And I interviewed a fellow, I believe it was last week, he called me. I can't I can't go into detail about his background, but I can just tell you, it, for what he experienced, like he said, he shouldn't have felt the way he did. Plus, he's been hunting for all his life, probably over 40 years. And about a week ago, early morning hours, he took his dog out for a walk. And he said, at that point, I'm, I'm near my woods and I've hunted these woods all my life. And he said, I had the most overpowering fear I've ever had in my life. He said, I was almost in shock. He said, I had no idea. And this dog immediately responded the same way. And the dog had to tell between the legs. And these horrific sounds were coming out of the woods. And he didn't know it. But just down this road from him, neighbors are reporting other things going on, too, including even recent weeks, those small orbs of light, small spheres of light coming within feet of their window of their house. And not far from there, just a couple miles down the road, in April of this year, in the afternoon and daylight, we had independent witnesses reporting a huge, solid, metallic object with multiple lights on hovering right over top of the trees. I never put the description out because I wanted to see if I would get other independent reports, which we did. I think that's often the best way because usually when you have a, an encounter or, or when somebody reports an encounter that's in the day in a populated area or a busy road stand, it's always best to kind of say, well, sort of tease people a little bit and say, well, we've had a report about a certain incident occurring just to see if you do get those corroborating reports. Is that something that still fishes people in and then more people come forwards these days? Because often, I think sometimes you can give too much information out when you're trying to get more witnesses to, to verify a strange occurrence. And yet, often, things are so widely reported that it's very easy for people to kind of jump on it. So are you still finding it difficult to kind of keep a lid on certain things to, to make sure that Anybody that does come forward is a genuine witness. Uh, yeah, we try to. And, and again, there there's so many little details. And even if we put something out, there may well be other information we aren't disclosing that we want people to try to confirm. And I one thing I've done, too, I don't give the names, identities out of witnesses to protect them because 99% of them ask me not to give their names out. And a lot of them have reputable positions and backgrounds. And I don't give out the exact location where things are go occurring because they occur a lot of us on private property. So, you know, that's the reason why we don't do that. But it, it's really interesting, the details. And that's something I've done all my life. You know, with these cases, for example, with the Kexford case. And, you know, I started documenting that when I was 16 years old in 65. And now, what's 57 years later, actually in the last several months, I've gotten a couple of interesting leads on the case. Nothing is going to open up the case, but it's more confirmation for other people. But over the years, for example, there would be certain details that would come to my attention about the Kexford case. It may have been years later till I had enough, enough independent confirmation from independent sources that I would publish what I found. And for example, without getting to a, the big thing about Kecksburg and the fact that something did fall from the sky that day, and most interestingly was that fact that you had multiple witnesses, including reporters on the scene, that confirmed a military presence shortly after the object fell. And that object, whatever it was, and we still don't know for sure what it was, was taken out of the area on a large military flatbed tractor trailer with a top over it, and they went out early the next morning to one of the air bases in Ohio, Lockbourne Air Force Base, stayed there for a short time, and then continued on to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But 
the thing that I found over many years, and now I have enough independent witnesses, was there wasn't just one military flatbed tractor trailer. There were two of them on the scene that night. Are you still surprised that people are coming forward about Kecksburg with little nuggets of information, Stan, or because of your experience and, and the things I've read about and spoken with other researchers and investigators? I have to say, I'm never surprised when, when these nuggets seem to shake loose because often... For a lot of people, even though we can speak about these subjects quite openly and candidly and without any fear of ridicule, because we don't care really, Stan, a lot of people, it still seems to be that they still have this old-fashioned idea of, of being laughed at. And and so for, for some witnesses, it does really seem to take them quite a long time to pluck up the courage and say, I've got to get this off my chest. I've held it in for too long. Well, you know, one thing I'm finding is this. Yeah, more and more people talking about UFO sightings. Bigfoot, uh, there's still a lot of ridicule with it, even with UFO sightings. It comes down to the data in the report, the information. And the more I'm finding is, the more unusual the incident is, the more detailed it is, the more complex it is, the more reluctant the witness is to talk about it publicly because it was something that just was life-changing to them. So that's very common. But with the Kexper case, uh, it, for, for example, back in July, I was at a big uh, four-day event um, that I was at, and it wasn't even a UFO event. It was a huge public event. And over four days, I think I had about five or six fellows in my age bracket uh, who came up, and this to them was no big deal. They said, hey, when I was a kid or a teenager, I was out there and I had my parents, and I saw the Army trucks. I saw the soldiers out there. Some talked about seeing the object with tarp on the on the military truck, but they they didn't even know each other. They weren't coming up the same time to talk to me, and they're all telling me pretty much the same story. So it this was more confirmation about what people saw that evening. I think this is one of the other aspects of this latest book as well, Stan, that I love, is the fact that some of these creatures are not what the average person would consider a cryptid, and yet for, for people like ourselves, there are certain animals that are cryptids because technically and genetically they're not supposed to exist in the way they do i wasn't surprised to see some black panther sightings in the book are you still surprised that the authorities are so adamant that this is all nonsense because the whole black panther and mysterious mountain lions cases seem to be reported all over the u.s in states that the population is supposed to not exist and obviously when we're talking about black panthers we're obviously meaning melanistic jaguars and leopards so when you speak to these people as someone as you mentioned in the book you were even stumbling across paw prints in the 80s are you still surprised that to all intents and purposes the authorities say this isn't happening these people are all wrong well i can tell you one we've had black panther sightings and they again reported this year and they're going on year after year they've been going on for years and years so here's the whole thing the mountain lions your cougar they've been around for, they were always here in pennsylvania historically and then years and years ago officially they were considered extirpated that they were no longer in this area of course we know they exist in other parts of the country that's not that unusual and i can tell you over the years I hear about mad lion sightings all the time, and officially they're not supposed to be out there. I, I believe mad lions have always been out here. I, I'm not going to go to my theory why I, why I think there's still so many sightings, but those are explainable reports. But the Black Panther phenomena is much different, and I don't think it's connected whatsoever to the, the mountain lion and the standard cougar sightings we're seeing. The mountain lion or the Black Panther reports are much more unusual. There's some unusual aspects to them at all. And I'll tell you the case that convinced me of that is when we're done. But anyhow, and again, sometimes in areas where you're having active Bigfoot encounters, you also have reports of black panthers. So you have this out-of-place animal showing up that's not supposed to be here. And uh, again, some of those cases are very strange. But here's the one that really convinced me that, again, we're dealing with something that is not a normal animal. So this is February of 1983, up in the mountains. This fellow is um, coming home from his friend's house around 1 o'clock in the morning. His car is overheating. It's very cold outside. He pulls up to his driveway and goes in the garage to get a can of antifreeze. So he comes out, and he's pouring the antifreeze in his vehicle. And while he's doing it, he hears this growl, this loud growl. And he turns around about 20 feet away. Here's this large black house cat just sitting in there looking at him growling. And he didn't think much of it because it's out in the country and there are stray cats out there. So he goes back to putting more antifreeze in the car. And about a minute or two later, he hears even a louder growl. So he turns around. And he's just shocked because that large house cat has now physically grown 
to about twice its size and it's fiercely growling at him. So he throws that can at it, and the thing turns around, growls against us, walking slowly out the door, up uh, outside uh, the driveway, which was uh, lit up pretty well. He goes inside and grabs his pistol, and when he comes back, he said he was just shocked. So here's this big cat that now looks just like what he described with the jaguar or leopard as you would see in a zoo. It was all dark black. It's huge with a long tail with glowing yellow eyes staring at him. He took a shot at it. He wasn't sure if he hit it, but seconds later, it physically vanished and disappeared right in front of him. <laughs> I mean, that's just one of those... Stra- I mean, you, there are occasions where we've heard people have strange encounters with cryptids of all descriptions where there is this change in size as though something seems to grow as it gets closer to stand. And often people say, oh, well, that may be his perspective. But I refuse to believe that someone so close to something would misidentify the size of a creature by several feet away. Oh, yeah. And again, with some of the... Um, some of the incidents that um, have happened, again, where people are so close to these creatures. Here's the whole thing, Paul. You know, yeah, and we haven't even talked about some of the strange entities and things people have been reporting for years. And you have all these credible people who want no publicity, want nothing out of this. They have nothing to gain. A lot of them, their lives have been changed. And they're reporting all these different types of strange creatures, entities that aren't supposed to exist. But at the same time, you have so many people from widespread areas that don't know each other that over the years are telling a similar account. So you can't dismiss it. The only thing, you can't have, possibly have all these different creatures out there that science hasn't confirmed. But at the same time, there's something going on here. And again, for lack of a better term, the more I'm knowing about this, again, it's so beyond our understanding to figure out what we're dealing with. But it seems as though, again, theoretically, that whatever we're dealing with, these things can suddenly appear, which we have many cases of this, especially with Bigfoot, where people are riding down the road, and all of a sudden this Bigfoot just appears, not just coming across the road, it just suddenly appears it in front of them. They can see it from head to toe and moves off and it's gone. And we've had cases like this with other type of cryptic cases as well, but similar type of reports. There have also been some incidents over the years. See, there's a lot of things people don't know about the, the Bigfoot mystery, where you have more than one cryptid seen together. And here's something I've found in recent years, and I've been talking about quite a bit in recent years, and others are beginning to know this as well, some other researchers. Some of the witnesses who are very physically close to Bigfoot or other cryptids, what they mentioned is when these cryptids, when these creatures realize that the human observer can see them, they have a startled effect on their faces. They're startled, and they react very quickly to get out of there. And it's so they're shocked that they're able to be seen. And I think that's a really interesting, maybe a clue to what we're working on. I know you mentioned it earlier on when you were on about when you were speaking with other researchers and they were sort of ignoring anything that they were either not interested in or not researching. Because I remember speaking with Tony Healy, and he went on a trip to Bluff Creek obviously the uh, ground zero for, for Bigfoot in the 1960s, Stan. And whilst he was there, he was interviewing a few locals and asking about Bigfoot. And one of the locals he was interviewing was saying, oh, yeah, well, you know, we were speaking with people like John Green and, and Rene de Hinden, and we were telling them about what had been going on, and we didn't really see that much of Bigfoot. But they were talking about these mysterious black panthers and strange lake monsters and sea creatures that were swimming up the river. And they said they weren't interested. They just, if it wasn't Bigfoot, they didn't care. Yeah, and, and I, I even know today there, there's Bigfoot researchers out there that just don't want to hear about these stories. Now, I've noticed in more recent years, and I've talked to a lot of these people in the Bigfoot field who are now beginning to question the same thing I did years ago, well, where's the bodies, for example? And uh, and again, we have these cases showing up around the world, which indicate we're dealing with something that, as bizarre as it sounds, may not be a normal flesh and blood animal. That's not to say there may be something out there that maybe we don't understand that is similar, but after all these years of all these studies all over the world, why hasn't a body shown up that we can confirm? Absolutely. And obviously, you will have certain encounters. Like there's a, there's a brilliantly tantalizing short report in the book, Stan, about someone who's driving in Westmoreland County and a small creature just lands on the hood of their car and then just leaps off again, which is one of those reports that you very rarely hear something like that occurring. And yet, that seems completely different to most normal Bigfoot encounters that we get reported. You very rarely hear of 
people having such an interaction with an animal landing on their car. You'll occasionally have people in cars who may have one come up having a nosy or banging on the window or something like that. And I know a few dogman encounters, people have claimed that the dogman scratched the car or jumped on it and, and then jumped off it again. And yet the thing about this story is it's, it's such a tantalising little tidbit of an encounter. You just think, well... How many other people have had this encounter with this strange leaping little Bigfoot? Yeah, and again, you know, most of the reports we get, these creatures range generally from six to nine feet tall. We've had a few cases, including one in recent months, that's well documented. Uh, again, up in another area of Fayette County that we investigated, and the, also the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society, I went up with their team to investigate it. And this thing was in the middle of the road. The guy, very credible witness again, watched this thing cross the road. It had luminous red eyes. And he could see the eyes uh, where they were located positioned up up the road sign. So this creature, when we went up to measure it, and we talked to him and figured out exactly where it was, this thing had to be at least 11 feet tall. And, again, very, very tall. So where do those things go? But um, we have a lot of reports over the years, not a lot. Well, we, uh, compared to the, the, the taller Bigfoot, we have a number of smaller Bigfoot creatures reported, generally between about four and a half to five feet tall. And uh, here, I'll, I'll give you another example of another strange connection. So May of 2019, outside of Pittsburgh in a rural area, early morning hours, this man got up, looked out the window. I don't know what he was doing. I may have gone to the restroom, not sure, not sure. But his whole area, there's a lot, there's a big yard and there's a lot of wood. And it's all illuminated very well at night. You can see very well. So here's this small creature with dark hair, uh, long hair on the head from the back. It was walking upright, arms are down, extending down to the knees. The arms were swinging as it moved. You could see this thing very, very clearly. It entered a particular area of the woods. And three, about three seconds later, in the exact location where this creature entered, a bright sphere of light, about three to four inches in diameter, suddenly appeared. And he said it was similar to looking directly at the front of a flashlight. It was about four feet off the ground. And it moved for a few seconds and vanished. And a few seconds later, it reappeared again. And when it did, that small sphere emitted a beam of light about 12, 10 to 12 feet long. It vanished, and that was the last we saw of either the creature or the light. Oh. <laughs> I just find it such a hotbed of strangeness that people, like we've been saying, Stan, often when people are taking these reports, they would probably ignore the aspects of the whole report, wouldn't they? Uh, well, some people do. Yeah, anybody <laughs> that takes the time to go out and, and interview people and look at the patterns, you begin, you have to have an open mind in any type of case you're dealing with, even if we're not talking about the paranormal or anything we investigate. And you just can't ignore it. And unfortunately, there's still people out there that would rather just pretend that these things are not occurring, but it's going on more and more now. There are things coming out that, that of recent date. There's more researchers. There's more investigators talking about it now all over the country. And they're not laughing so much like they did several years ago. <laughs> I was very interested to see the Thunderbird report that the driver who was coming down the road at half past 10 at night, so he'd got his headlights on and was clearly aware enough of his surroundings to spot a deer at the side of the road when all of a sudden this enormous bird swoops down in front of him, Stan. This is often one of those aspects that giant birds get reported from certain states and are always dismissed as misidentification or people can't judge distance and size from certain areas. And yet this witness is clearly fully aware of what was going on and could even see how far above the road this creature seems to be gliding. Yeah, and in fact, we have cases even more detailed than that. It is very difficult to judge altitudes and size just like it is with UFO cases in, in many instances. However, we have incidents of these huge flying creatures very low off the ground, and in fact, incidents where they're actually on the road, where they're blocking vehicles, and their wings are opened up. So we had one case I looked into. Oh, my, this goes back to, I think, about 2017, somewhere around there. And uh, this was in neighboring West Virginia. But th there was a two-lane road early morning. It's daylight. He's riding down this two-lane road, and the spot says he had to brake very hard because here's this huge, giant, flying creature, this giant bird right in front of him, blocking the road, eating roadkill. He said he was as tall as his vehicle, was at least four feet tall, and it looked, they looked at each other, stared at each other, and it was trying to get off the ground at that point. It was flapping its wings. It was popping from one leg to another, but it was so heavy, 
he could barely get off the ground. And he's watching these wings flapping, and he can see the end of the wingtips. And at the end of the, uh, the, the wingtips, at the end of each road, at the, uh, where the road uh, joined the side, he could see the dust and dirt going up. And finally, this thing rose up and went over the trees and was gone. He went back the next day and measured it. It was 21 feet across. Well, how are you going to misjudge that? That's, I mean, that's often a really good idea of being able to gauge the size of something when you've got a physical entity that you can use as measurement. Yeah. And these cases are, again, it, it's much more involved than just the huge giant bird aspect of it. You know, when I talk about the Thunderbird subject, there's different categories. They're similar reports, but different. So you've got these huge oversized birds look somewhat similar to a, a turkey vulture, generally dark brown or black in color. So you have a lot of those kind of reports. You're talking a wingspan of around 10 to 20 feet in many of the reports we're getting. And, and again, if you go on my website, stangordon.info, there's some amazing cases on there from last year, very detailed daylight close encounters with these huge flying creatures. Anyhow, then the other category is you've got this other series of reports of these huge, solid, generally black, featherless, leathery, bat-like creatures that you've been seeing. And then you've got another category, and again, credible people, some amazing backgrounds. They're extremely reluctant to tell me about it. Um, you can look at my Thaish Encounters book. I think it was some a pretty good um, artist conception in there. One of the witnesses who swear they saw close up what they believe were prehistoric. They swear they saw a, ter a pterodactyl or a, ter a, ter a, ter a pteratorn. And uh, anyhow, again, you have those categories. And then we have some of, uh, we have these odd creature reports. The one pretty famous up in this area, I investigated back in, I believe it was 2011 up in Butler County, that they called the Butler Gargoyle, had this tall, eight foot tall, leathery skinned, hairless creature with wings tucked into its back. And, and then, of course, we have the famous Mothman reports from West Virginia. And if you notice my new Creepy Cryptids book, there's a whole story in there that's never been released before on the amazing incident that happened in the Pittsburgh area, maybe before the Mothman accounts occurred in West Virginia. It's amazing, again, what all these reports, there are so many. I mean, we don't even have time to begin to even touch on the things that have been going on and have gone on over the years and, and the quality of the report and the, and the reputation of the people who are seeing these things that want no publicity. Absolutely. I, and you must have been able to read my mind because I was about to mention that particular story because I believe it's C. William Davis III who mentions this strange encounter, which didn't happen to him, but it was his best friend, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and that fellow came to his home right after it happened with an estate of shark. And I mean, it's, it's just an amazing account of, of seeing this winged something standing right next to his car when he and his girlfriend were on a date. And uh, and again, I had previously published, I believe it was in Astonishing Encounters. I, during that time, I believe 60s, I'm about 30 miles from Pittsburgh. I had heard rumors. And again, you got to remember the time period. It's all word of mouth back then. And I heard rumors of something similar to a moth man had been seen in the Pittsburgh area, but I could not track it down. And it was years and years later. Then I came across an actual witness who was involved in one at another location in Allegheny County outside of Pittsburgh who had encountered this creature. And then we have this other account now from another location around that time period where something else was going on. So it was very interesting. There are some uh, amazing encounters in this in the creepy cryptid section of the book. The one that really stuck out to me was this strange egg-like headed creature that the witness described it as being sickly looking. Oh, yeah. And those reports are coming in now from all over the country. Um, I had heard about this going back um, around 2017. I, I had some reports of some tall, very skinny, thin creatures were seen, and I can't say for sure they're connected. But this case, uh, this one was extremely credible. It was August of 2017, and it was the police officer on patrol who contacted me not long after it happened. And um, he told me this was the weirdest thing he'd ever seen in his life. He couldn't explain what he saw. He patrolled this rural area in western Pennsylvania all the time. And that evening, he was patrolling, and he saw this strange bag of light on the ground. And he stopped his vehicle because he thought, I've never seen any type of lights or advertising or any, any artificial lighting like that. So as he's watching this bulb light on the ground, it suddenly rises up from the ground. It's a dull white color, and he realizes that this is actually the head 
of the weirdest looking thing he has ever seen. He said it was about six feet tall, maybe a little larger. It was tall and skeletal thin. It was hairless. He said, from what he could recall, it appeared as though it must have been lying on its belly on the ground with his head facing the road. And then it stood up facing the road. And then in that dark area, he could see that dull light from the glowing out illuminating the other section of the body. And he told me, he said, when this thing turned and moved, he said, it turned to his left and it moved off at the most incredible speed he had ever seen him move. He said, and this is what's interesting how he described it. He said, it was, it, fa it was faster than anything I'd ever seen in my life. It was there and then it was gone. And that's almost the same wording some cryptid witnesses have said to me. It was there and then it was gone. And he went on to tell me this thing had a chest about 18 inches across. The waist appeared to be small, but the arms were unusually long. The long legs looked skeletal with no muscle mass, but the skin body tone looked kind of a bad grayish blue, and he couldn't see the facial features of it. And then a couple of weeks later, from another area, another witness is out in the country, and she sees this large UFO hovering over the tree, and she's hearing these odd sounds coming from the woods. And about that time, as it's starting to get dark, I remember it was getting, I believe it was about dusk, she sees what she thought was a person. She thought maybe a neighbor coming up out of the woods, starting to walk in her direction. But as this person gets close, she realizes it's not a person, but it's a tall, very skinny, hairless, sickly looking being. And that was interesting. And then it was the next, that was in the fall of, of that, 2018, I believe it was. I could be off a little bit. I think it was fall of 2018. In another county, I interviewed another fellow, and actually I, I was there, and I saw where it happened. And he lives out in the woods, and he's very familiar with the sounds of deer, a lot of deer around his property. He knows the sounds of the animals. He was up there working on his property, and he heard these bipedal sounds that sounded very odd. So it kind of unnerved him, and he decided he went down to his house, and he, was, he sat down at the table, dining room table, He's about 10 feet away from the back door that faces the woods. There's no traits. There's nothing obscuring the window. You can see right through it, this big, big blast back door. And he said, all of a sudden he looks, and here is this very skeletal, thin, hairless creature down on all fours, very thin extremity with glowing yellow eyes staring right at him. And he said he, he turned around for a second. He looked back and was scampering around the side of the house and was gone. And it took, he told me, it, it took him quite a while for him to ever go back in the woods again. And the woods is his backyard. It just doesn't make sense because often you would suggest that sometimes people, when they encounter these creatures, as you mentioned earlier, often they will try and get out of the way or disappear. And many people say when they've had Bigfoot sightings, Stan, that the creature will try and get away from them. And then when we're looking at some of these very creepy cryptids that are being reported in the area, they don't seem to care. I mean, this one's looking through somebody's door at him. Yeah. And again, you know, as I mentioned, it's not on all the cases and it's something that we have to ask more questions about with witnesses, but we got to be careful not to leave them. We don't want to suggest anything, so we've got to be very careful. But again, you know, in some cases, these things, once they realize they're being seen, they hurriedly move away from the area. And again, that's not in all cases, but we're seeing that more and more. And again, with the Bigfoot cases, you know, we have incidents where these things look completely physically solid. We have other instances where sometimes the people say part of the body is solid. Some other sections, it's like out of focus, or it's more misty looking or foggy looking, or there's like a fog or haze around them when they're seeing them. So we have this variation in the reports as well. Yeah. I mean, some of the other interesting points of the book are you've, you've got some amazing pictures in there from witnesses who have happily supplied these pictures for you to use in the book. One of them that made me chuckle and scratch my head isn't particularly scary or frightening, but it's that weird boulder stuck in the top of a tree stand. Yeah, isn't that great? That's on top of the Chestnut Ridge. And I spent, especially in my younger days, I spent a, a lot of time with my teams up on those ridges, especially around Derry and Westmoreland County, which is an area well, we continue to receive reports. This past Mother's Day afternoon, a, a woman was taking a leisurely walk up in there along the ridge. Beautiful afternoon. Within, I know it was less, she told us less than 50 feet away, this eight-foot-tall Bigfoot came out of the woods. She saw it from head to toe. It never looked at her. It kept walking and walked off into another section of the woods. Her dog just paused and, and cowered and 
it, it didn't make any kind of sound at all, didn't bark at all. And she told me it took her quite a while before she was feeling safe to go back out there again, even though it did come after her, didn't even know she was there. And, and I can tell you, of the hundreds of cases I've worked on, if these things wanted to hurt somebody, they quit. They could easily have outrun the people. Uh, generally, when they're seen, they take off. They're very curious about human activity. But yes, there are reports that you think are throwing pretty good sized uh, branches or large rocks or boulders towards them. And that's very common. But anyhow, going back to that that report, yeah, there's other anomalies that we're learning about that have been taking place up on the ridge. Uh, again, there, there there is so many new things I've been uncovering in over the last couple of years. And some of this I'll talk about more in the future. But I need more documentation. But that's so interesting because, one, there's no place for a boulder up in that part of the ridge for, for it to fall into a tree. And then you got that other picture that was, on, I think, the previous page. And it's very hard to see there. But what that was, some of the people with a large amount of property up the top of that one section of the ridge, they walked there all the time. And years ago, they called me to come out because there was something very strange that they came across. And I hadn't been there before. So they had this very tall older tree that's apparently been hollowed out by a lightning strike. And they had always noticed that hollow inside of that tree. But when they walked by it this particular day, here's what's interesting. Inside of that hollow air of the tree was another live tree turned upside down, roots up, pushed the whole way down inside the other tree. And one, there's no trees like that in the area that we could find. And two, I'm pretty familiar with weather phenomena and weather data because I deal with that as well. There was no indication, for example, of microburst in that area. So that's just another one of the mysteries that's been showing up. I think upside down trees, whenever we're talking about the world of Bigfoot, Stan, are always something that I find really hard for people to explain away. And I know there are certain areas of the U.S., particularly in Alaska and certain parts of Canadian provinces, where there will be these areas where trees seem to have been uprooted and stuck back into the ground, so the roots are showing. And when you look at this, as you say, it would be the chances of a tree being picked up by a gust of wind, turned upside down and dropped precisely inside a hollow tree that had been struck by lightning seems incredulous to suspect that it, that has a very natural explanation, really. Oh, yeah. And, and again, as you can see, it was pretty high up off the ground, too. Yeah. So something had to be extremely tall and extremely strong to be able to do that. I know one of the aspects I wanted to touch on before I let you leave, Stan, is obviously you've continued to keep your team going out there into the field and taking these reports. Over the last two years, it seems that nothing seems to be slowing down. And if anything, it seems to be getting faster. Now, do you think that's because a lot of people have been forced to stay at home and in their local areas, so they've gone out more locally than they used to previously? And so they've been taking more notice of their areas around where they live? Or do you think it's that more people have become more open-minded and are looking towards the skies and taking more notice when they go walking in the woods and forests in their area? I'm not really sure that either one of those thoughts have any direct connection because, because one, I was receiving reports steadily before the pandemic hit here. Mm. And these reports continued and they've continued right through the last few days. Many of these, again, are daylight sightings. They're very close range. It's not just incidents being reported out in the woods, but a lot of these are being reported in more populated areas and near housing developments. And again, the majority of people calling in, most of these people had never seen anything before. They didn't believe in these things before. They had no extra interest in it. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in recent months, and a lot of these people aren't even aware of the fact that government is now investigating UFO sightings very seriously. A lot of these people didn't even know about that. So I, I really don't think... From the details of reports coming in, the close range reports, I don't think it has any connection between the two. I think true as well, because it seems when I've spoken to other researchers and investigators, Stan, about a lot of things that have been going on in the last two years, some people are caught saying that paranormal reports are up. Other people are saying, as far as they're concerned, things have pretty much stayed fairly steady. And I think often the, the perception from a sceptical point of view is that people are overly influenced by the media. And as you've referred to there about the US government's UAP task force and the fact that they're opening up and trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, for people like us, it's like, well, for us, it's normal conversation. We can talk about this. And people will say, oh, well, everybody knows about it now. I'm 
in my personal conversations, I would say that the vast majority of my friends are not aware that this is going on. And I agree. The majority of witnesses I've interviewed in recent months had no idea about this. So it wouldn't have made any, there would not have been any, uh, any deal, any connection between the two. And uh, so I don't think that's the case. And I can tell you, and you know, the pandemic has eased a little bit around here now. I've just started going out again. I'm getting a lot of calls to do lectures and presentations around the area, different events. And I've started to go out. And some of these events have had very, very good crowds. The Kecksburg UFO, we had thousands of people there. And the conference we did, we had a, more than a packed house of hundreds of people. But what was so, what's so intriguing is, you know, I was there. We had other researchers there. I was just literally overwhelmed with people coming up and sharing sightings they had had in recent weeks and months or in past years. And none of these people had reported these things to anybody. And everywhere I've gone in recent weeks to do talks, the same thing. People come up to me from everywhere. Nobody's reported it. We cannot even imagine the extent of the reports because I get a lot of reports, but a lot of my research associates across the state, they get reports. We're all getting reports. We don't have any idea how much of this is going on. It's much more active, much more common than people realize. Why do you think that is, Stan? Do you think people just don't care anymore? Or do you think that the last two years have made people think more about being open and, and living for the moment rather than hiding things away? No, I just think that they're having more experiences. More people are seeing things. More people are trying to find out what it is they saw. More people are curious. They don't want to go public and call the newspapers, but they want to find out what it is that they saw. And the it's just the amount of activity going on, and that's just how it is. Now, you also got to remember, it's not just in Pennsylvania. I, these things go on everywhere. Yes, we have a lot of activity here, but you also got to remember, my office has been open since 1969. Even though my group's not active anymore, they're quite a while I've been working independently, but I'm in touch with many other smaller groups and individual researchers are very active. So I have a lot of connections with these people. We have a very good input for information. Uh, I still receive reports from many resources. And so we get a lot of reports in here, but there's so many other reports we're finding out that people never reported before. And again, we can't even understand how much this might be occurring that we are not aware of. Mm. Are you still getting a lot of people coming to the area to do research who aren't from the locality, that they're from other states? I know the, the fabulous Small Town Monsters crew visited a couple of years ago, Stan, and did that brilliant documentary, Invasion in Chestnut Ridge, which you featured in. And I thought, as soon as I heard the word Chestnut Ridge, you were the first person that came to mind. I thought, well, you've got to be involved in this in some capacity. So are you still getting external researchers coming to the area following your research and that of your team over the last several decades? Over the years, I understand there have been other researchers from other parts of the state. Others have come in on occasion to do some investigation in different areas. So yeah, there's a lot of interest out there. And uh, and again, it, it's going on surrounding here. Ohio's active. West Virginia's active, from what I'm hearing. There's a lot of things going on in other areas as well. So you've got more and more researchers out there. And again, we don't even know. There's there's so many new researchers out there that I'm not even aware of in Pennsylvania. And a lot of them apparently are on social media and they're talking about their investigation. So a lot of people are out there doing research now. And a lot of them, from what I understand, they're beginning to find and they're also receiving some of these reports that are small spheres of light and other anomalies of some of their areas as well. Do you still get as much excitement when a new case comes across your desk, Stan, as you did 50 years ago? I imagine I know the answer to this already, but is it? do you still have that same enthusiasm you had all those years ago as a young man? Oh, I, I, I think I do, and uh, it's so interesting just talking to so many credible people that give you these great details, and I just, I'm in touch, somebody just got in touch with me yesterday about an event that happened several months ago. And I'm not going to go into detail yet because I'm still gathering data, but it's another really interesting case. There are so many out there we just never heard about. And yeah, it, it's something, that, it's ongoing all the time. You just never know what's going to happen with the next report that comes in. Well, Stan, it's been an absolute pleasure to spend some time in your company again. It's been far too long since I was able to pick your brains about a variety of topics. Where can everybody get hold of your books and follow your work online, please? Well, 
My website is Stan Gordon, G O R D O N dot info, I N F O. Uh, my contact information is on there as well. They can reach me by email very easily. My four books Really Mysterious Pennsylvania, Astonishing Encounters, Pennsylvania's Unknown Creatures, Solid Invasion, the Pennsylvania UFO Bigfoot Casebook, which is a book that you have talked about. If they want to learn about those really strange cases of 1973 and all the weird things that happened, it's a really good book. And the new book, which I'll guarantee has a lot of incidents in there. And, and cryptids that people never heard of before, probably. It's Creepy Cryptids and Strange UFO Encounters of Pennsylvania. And the books are all available on Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com. Brilliant. I recommend all your work highly. Creepy Cryptids, the latest one, is fantastic. As you touched on there, primarily because there are some very strange and very unnerving creatures included in it, Stan, and rather the witnesses have that experience than myself. So thank you again for your time. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you again. And thanks for having me on, Paul. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks again for the interview.